Hello everybody, my name is Nail Haddad and I go by Maisa. I'm proudly Palestinian from Gaza. Both my mom and dad's families are still trapped in Gaza. Whenever they have connection, they share with me the horrific stories they witness. And I'll be their voices today. Since October 7, I have lost so many family members and friends. Some were killed, some were lost, we've lost contact with, and some are still under the rubble, and some were taken hostages by the Israeli occupation forces, or what they call it, prisoners. Since October 7, my childhood home, the park that we used to play in, the supermarket down the street, our farm, our olive trees, our fig trees, it has all been destroyed. It is now unrecognizable. My grandparents, uncles, and aunts who used to live in the dream home in Arimal area, which is central of Gaza, were forced to evacuate after they received posters of evacuation. At first, they ignored it. They didn't want to leave their homes. Especially my grandparents. My grandma said, and I quote, I refuse to relive the Naqba again. If I die, I die in my home, on my land. They wanted to stick together, so they all decided to stay. But after bombs increased in the area, and after my grandma broke her shoulder due to a nearby airstrike, they were forced to leave for their own safety, even though there's no safe place in Gaza. And once again, my family locked their home, took the key, took some clothes and food, and started walking. My uncle, my aunt, my little cousin, my grandpa, and my grandma, with her broken, untreated shoulder. They all walked eight hours to the south, Carrying their babies, carrying their stuff, holding hands with their children, while also pushing my grandparents since they were both in a wheelchair. I've received pictures of that day, and my heart broke seeing my grandma's face trying to stay strong, while also holding her tears. They have refugees to a school in the south that was at overcapacity. So the first night, they slept in the streets because there's no space. The next morning, they were able to find some space, but they got separated. Some slept in tents and some in schools and classrooms where they shared it with 100 other people. And then again, they were told to move to the south. And then a little bit more to the south. Currently, they're in Rafah, which is 10 minutes away, walking distance from Egyptian borders. There is no more south to go. One time, I was on a phone call with one of my uncles, and I heard a conversation between him and his little son. The son came up to his dad, and he asked him, Dad, I'm hungry. Do you have any food left? My uncle replied, No, I don't. Check with your mom. She might have something. Then the son replied, no, she doesn't. I was just there. Then the, my uncle told him, check with your grandma. She still has half a piece of bread. Go ask her for it. Then the son replied, no, I'm not very hungry. My grandma's diabetic and she'll need it later. The son is eight years old, also diabetic. He's eight years old. I'll never forget this conversation. You shouldn't either. People are starving to death. My uncle tells me that most of the time they sleep hungry. The aid that is coming into Gaza is not enough. Two of my uncles are journalists. They have covered numerous wars in Gaza. So whenever I hear a reporter got shot, bombed, killed, targeted, or threatened. It affects me deeply. 
So I want to have a moment of silence and a prayer for the reporter that got killed last week, Hamza Tahdu. Please give him some prayers. Hamza Tahdu, along with 115 other journalists, got killed in this genocide alone. Same. To all the people who are uncomfortable of us being here every week, I don't care. I don't care that it makes you uncomfortable. Because your silence makes me extremely uncomfortable. The work can't hear the voices of Gaza, so let's loudly be their voices and proudly raise their flag.